Thank you so much, Evelyn. I got a little gift last week from someone. It was a little hand crocheted uh, in a frame uh, needlepoint. And it had a wonderful message that I think is so appropriate as we remember Jesus today as we meet for our communion celebration. It wasn't nails that held him to the cross, but his love for you and me. Jesus' love held him on the cross, put him on the cross, gave him a heart to live the life he lived so that we could have eternity with him. You know, when you think of the, the communion service, you know, as Jesus was coming to the end of his ministry on this earth as a, as a man united with God, God in the human flesh, living out his will, and demonstrating God's love, as he, as, he did, as he did that, he told, he instituted this beautiful service the ordinance of humility and the communion service. And he did it. And it tells a story. His love, his humility and self-sacrifice and willingness to serve, his willingness to show that love at the cross, yeah. uh, the promise in the, in, in the, in the, that he gave that it would bring us to remember him when he comes. We would do this and it would help us to remember when he comes and that we will be spending eternity with him. Let's, we're going to talk about that this morning, so let us, let us pray. Precious Lord, we're so thankful for Jesus this morning. We're so thankful that it was not nails that held Jesus on the cross. He could have got off in a split second. He didn't even have to go to the cross. But it was love that drove him to the cross. And it was love that held him there until he said the words, it is finished. Lord, it's love that we need, your love for you, an understanding of your love for us that will transform our lives and make us all that you've called us to be. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful gift of your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord's Supper. The Seventh-day Adventist Church doesn't celebrate the Lord's Supper every week or once a month, but we have chosen to, cel cel uh, to celebrate it once a quarter. Every, every three months we uh, come together to remember in a very special way. Jesus says, do this as oft as you drink it. So this is how it maintains its specialness. The Lord's Supper is really a commemoration of what it cost Jesus to save us from our sins. The life of God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, had to be sacrificed in order for him to ransom us back from the clutches of the evil one. And so as taking part in the Lord's Supper is really a solemn thing. It's, it's really an awesome thing to think about and to meditate upon and to prepare our hearts for. Our participation in this communion service therefore requires from us adequate pre preparation. It's a, this preparation time is a time to examine our own hearts, our own conscience. The Bible says uh, to examine yourself and to see that you are in the Faith walk with Jesus. It's a time for self-examination. It's a time to confess our sins to God in, and in sincere repentance. Sadly, a few hours before his death, the death of Jesus, his apostles did not seem concerned about anything but which one of them was going to be the greatest. They were fighting over power and position leading up to Jesus' death. Even when he said, one of you are going to betray me, they said, is it me, is it me, is it me, is it? And then, and then he went back to fighting over who was going to be the greatest. They were really focused on, on themselves. However, Jesus was about to institute a service to be held uh, 
that would stay with the church right down until he comes. The service would invite them to renounce their pride and their ambitions and to prepare them for the communion service. And this is how John introduces the service that Jesus was going to institute to prepare his disciples for the Lord's Supper. And it's in John 13. We don't have time to read it, but if you would please read it, because uh, one of the unique things, and it's not totally unique to Seventh-day Adventist Christians, but we take, we take seriously uh, the, this, um, the, the, the service that Jesus uh, um, introduced and encouraged us to follow, and that is the foot washing, the foot washing service. Uh, which, uh, now we'll just, uh, I don't have time to read it, but you can read that in John 13, and how, it tells the story, though, and, and the custom was, when they would gather in a gathering like they did, with, uh, uh, to come together for the Passover meal, they would, uh, there would be a servant, and as the guests came into the house, they would, uh, they would take their sandals off, the servant would wash their feet, he would dry their feet, and then they would go and take their place on the floor because they ate at a floor, not on a table, and they would uh, gather together to celebrate the, the Passover dinner. And, and so there was, in this particular case, there was the bowl, there was the towel, but what was missing? The servant. The water was there too, but there was no servant. And as Jesus, they, they were eating, but before he put into place the special element of the remembrance, the remembrance service part, he got up from the table and he went over because everyone was looking at the, they all wondered, well, where's the servant? You know, where's the servant? You know, I'm not going to stoop down and wash Peter's feet. I'm not going to wash John's feet. I mean, ah, oh, yeah, that's a servant's job. That's not my job to humble myself. And so they were very much, uh, uh, very much um, conflicted. There was no servant, but they certainly weren't going to take that role. And then Jesus got up. And I'm sure their hearts were touched as he walked over to that bowl of water, took off his outer garment, wrapped the towel around him, and went to each of the disciples, and he washed their feet. That was an act of tremendous humility. And you can be sure in that foot washing service that the water, when he finished, was very dirty because they lived in Palestine, a very dirty, well, dusty, not necessarily dirty, but dusty place. And they walked with sandals. But according to the custom then, that is Jesus fulfilled the role of the servant. He wanted his disciples to learn the, the lesson of humility and by willingness to wash one another's feet. So Jesus himself washed their feet, teaching them the real lesson of humility. Foot washing is a service that teaches us to humble ourselves and to serve others, whatever the social rank and position is. Participating in the ordinance of humility, we call it the foot washing service, is an opportunity for us to examine our conscience and to complete our preparation for the Lord's Supper, participating in the in the bread and the wine, symbols of Jesus' broken body and shed blood. So Jesus clearly indicates that we must observe it, knowing uh, that this service is vital to prepare our hearts to take part in the Lord's Supper. And it's interesting how Christendom generally has avoided this, and it's not really, it's sort of interesting, because isn't it almost like the disciples didn't want to humble themselves, so they avoided the foot washing, and now the Christian church generally down through history has also avoided the foot washing. Isn't that interesting? Is it because, generally speaking, Christians don't want to humble ourselves to the extent of giving ourselves completely and serving others? Is it be, you know, is that, I, I think, you know, it's something to think about. But the bottom line is, as our pioneers in the Seventh-day Adventist church, who wanted to be biblical Christians, wanted to have the same spirit, the solo scriptura. You know, why do Seventh-day Adventists keep the Sabbath? Because Jesus did. It's not to be different, not to be annoying, not to be, you know, a, you know, a spoke, uh, like a, you know, sort of a broken cogger. It, it, it's only because it's in the Bible. 
And Jesus never said to keep any other day holy. He never said keep the sun, Sunday holy, Sabbath, or Wednesday holy, or Tuesday holy. He said to keep the seventh day Sabbath holy. He said it at creation, and Jesus kept it by his, he said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. And he said, and so we keep the Sabbath because of Jesus. Nothing, only one reason. Because of Jesus. And, and so this institute, which was really interesting, there's more said about this service than there is about, this, about Jesus making very clear that they were to do this. Because this was new. The Sabbath was not new. All the Christians kept the Sabbath. Paul kept the Sabbath long after Jesus had taken, had taken his rest and gone to heaven. He, he kept the Sabbath. Uh, and all the disciples kept the Sabbath. And there was never anything written by God other than the Sabbath. But this new service needed Jesus to give it some authority. And when something is said three times in Scripture, it means that God really takes it seriously. And so Jesus, if you read in John chapter 13 and verse 14, verse 15 and verse 17, you'll read these words. Jesus said, you also ought to wash one another's feet in verse 14. In verse 15, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. And, and in verse 17, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. You know, when we know the truth, happy are we when we do it. I was talking to a friend this week who, uh, was, who has learned the truth about salvation. Learned the beautiful truth that we're not saved by keeping a law, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves, lest anyone should boast. And when that person found out this good news, she is so happy. She said, a great weight rolled off my back because I no longer, it's not about me saving myself. It's about Jesus and his righteousness and, his, and the cross and his blood. Amen? Amen? That's how we're saved. So some people would say, well, you Seventh-day Adventists, you're trying to save yourself by keeping the Sabbath. Absolutely not. In fact, it's interesting. That's the one commandment says rest. We are actually resting. We're not working. We're not trying to save ourselves by work. We're saving ourselves by faith in Jesus. And Jesus said, the Sabbath is a sign between me and you that I am the God that sanctifies. Jesus, when we accept Christ as our Savior, he begins a good work in us to, to transform us and make us like himself. And he, and he said, and he, and he, he says, he says, I have not come to take away, do away with the law. He says, not one jot or tittle will in any ways pass from the law till all things are fulfilled. Jesus just said, I didn't come to destroy the law. He says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. It's amazing. And so, so Jesus spoke a lot about the Sabbath. He also spoke clearly about the foot washing, which I think is really, really interesting. He says, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. So baptism, which is a complete immersion, as our dear uh, Baptist friends, and you know what? The Baptist friends who, in the, in, back in the, in the 1500s, when they came to the, to the other Christians with baptism by immersion, do you know that many of them were burnt to the stake? They were killed, they were tortured, because they brought a biblical truth called baptism by immersion. Isn't that amazing? The intolerance of Christianity. You know, of Christians, and these are Christians that had been persecuted by the Catholic Church, and now these good Protestants are persecuting other Protestants because they come with something that's in the Bible, but they don't, uh, they haven't embraced it yet, they haven't learned it yet, and so now they're going to, rather than say, well, let's sit down and study this thing out, and let's pray about it, and let's come together uh, and study these things, I reject it, and you die. That is not the spirit of Jesus. Agreed? We need to be faithful and let the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said when he left, he said, it's better that I go. If I go, I will send the Holy Spirit, and he will do what? Lead you into all truth. Christians, rather than trying to come together and do away with our doctrines and just come together and love each other, which is what the big ecumenical movement is all about, what the Bible says that we should do is that we should come together with the, under the power of the Holy Spirit, open the word of God and study and let God guide us into all truth. Not do away with the truth, but to get deep, dig deeper and get more truth. Amen to that? Amen. So Jesus is coming soon. And the, this movement, there's two groups in the world. One group is saying, give me more of Jesus. And the other group is saying, give us more of tradition. 
And we have to make a decision. Are we going to be on the side of tradition that is not biblically founded, or are we going to be on the side of Jesus and follow him? So the foot washing is a preparatory work for, the, for baptism. And baptism, uh, it's like a little baptism. Jesus said, you don't have to. You don't have to be rebaptized. Remember, Peter said, wash me fully. Because, he, you know, he didn't want to let Jesus wash his feet. Then he said, wash me completely. And Jesus says, no, you don't have to be baptized again. All you need is to let me wash your feet. And it's sort of symbolic of the fact that dust is symbolic of sin. And, you know, as we travel along the road, not, we, we don't purposely sin, but sometimes we get tricked into sin or we, our own selfish nature, chooses to sin. But the bottom line is, we don't have to be rebaptized every time we sin. But this service is a special time where we confess our sins to God and we let him wash us, wash our feet, wash the sin away, as it were. And that's what Jesus said the purpose of this special service was in preparing us then to partake of the bread and the wine. Symbols, not literal, but symbols of his broken body and shed blood. So we now better understand Jesus' words. He who is washed through baptism does not need to be rebaptized when he makes an error since he has not lost his faith in Christ. So foot washing is a continuous guarantee of the cleansing grace of Christ. So let us remember that through baptism and foot washing, there is no cleansing virtue in and of themselves. There's no magical power. It's all by faith. Christ is the one who, through these services, cleanses us. Uh, when we take part in the service of foot washing and the Lord's Supper, it strengthens our faith and our communion with our Savior, Jesus Christ. By taking part in this service of foot washing and the Lord's Supper, we renew our covenant with Jesus Christ, once again inviting him to dwell in our hearts, thus solidifying the bonds that unite us to our Savior and our Lord. And of course, our participation in these services of foot washing and Lord's Supper strengthens our communion with each other. So it strengthens our communion with God and one another because we are participating with each other. We, and we, you know, when you, when you wash one, one another's feet, you know, we, when we get down and we kneel down and we have our, our partner there, we ask, we have a prayer for our partner. And we ask the Lord to bless them. And, and we ask the Lord to confess our, we confess our sins, not literally, but I mean, we, internally, we ask him to forgive us. We do that, that specific work at home in our quiet spot. But we, 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 we confess our sins, ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins, we ask, and we ask a blessing upon the one we're, we're washing the feet of. And we are asking then to God to bless them and their families and to help them in their spiritual walk with Jesus. And so if you've never done a foot washing before, this is, and this could be your very first time, be, be very, don't be uncomfortable, just enjoy and be blessed. If you want to come and watch, you're welcome to do that as well. It's, uh, it's truly a blessing uh, from the Lord uh, to be able to participate. And so uh, by By taking part in the service of foot washing and the Lord's Supper, we renew our covenant, as I've mentioned. We participate. And so, then lastly, it points us to Jesus' coming. If you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 26, for as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's work, the Lord's death, till he comes. And then in Matthew chapter 26, verse 29, Jesus said, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So Jesus said that the next time he will drink, the fruit of the vine will be in heaven. Now some people think that this fruit of the vine is al an alcoholic, fermented alcohol. And there are churches that drink fermented alcohol. But it's very interesting. Jesus says, I won't drink of this fruit of the vine until I'm with us all together in heaven. Now, in heaven, there's no such thing as death. Nothing dies. Nothing ferments in heaven. Fermentation is a, is a symbol of sin in Scripture. There is no sin in heaven. 
So when Jesus says, I'm not going to drink of this wine, this, this, the, the fruit, of the, the, the fruit of, the, of the vine, again, it's non-fermented. He's saying the same thing I drank here tonight, I'm not going to drink it again until we're together in heaven. The same stuff, not fermented. In, in Jewish tradition, they were to, in the Passover, they were to get rid of anything fermented out of the home. Nothing fermented because it was a symbol of sin. There's absolutely no way that Jesus served his disciples fermented wine as a remembrance of his pure and, and sacrifice and his shed blood. There was nothing impure in Jesus. And so you cannot use fermentation, uh, fermented product to be a symbol. Uh, it's a total, uh, a total blasphemy. It's a totally against God's plan and God's will. And he'll drink the same pure juice in heaven, the same pure juice he drank on earth. Amen? Amen. And so praise the Lord for that. And then, lastly, he says, Verily I say unto you, well, he said it three times, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He said the same thing three times. He wouldn't drink it again. And then I think of Matthew 8. And when Jesus heard it, and he was talking about the centurion, when he, when he heard this, the centurion's faith, you remember he was so amazed at this faith of the centurion. It was so different than the children of Israel. They didn't have faith where this, the, this Gentile had great faith. And Jesus says, when, I heard, when, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, I have not found, found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Of course, they wanted to stone him for that. And, and he said unto them, that he said unto them, unto, and I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and from the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom, the ones that God called, the children of Israel, the ones that God called, or even you could put ourselves in that way, Christians today that are called by him, shall be cast out into the outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. People who profess, you see, profession of, a, of faith in God doesn't save us. It is whether or not we have true faith in God, a faith like the centurion had, where he had complete faith in Jesus. And so, um, so he says that, and then he says, Jesus said unto, uh, said unto the centurion, go thy way as thou hast believed, so it is done unto thee and his servant was healed that selfsame hour. So we, we, so we hear his lovely voice one day soon at his second coming saying, come my people, you have come out of great tribulation and done my will, Suffer for, suffered for me, come into the supper, for I have girded myself and serve you. We shouted, and this is a quote from the book, The Great Controversy, we shouted, hallelujah, glory, and entered the city. And I saw a table of pure silver. It was many miles in length, yet our eyes could, ex could extend over it. In heaven, we're going to be different. When we get our glorified bodies, we're going to be able to see for miles, maybe thousands of miles, telescopes, microscopes, everything in these amazing bodies that God will give us in these glorified bodies. I saw the fruit of the tree of life, the manna, the almonds, the figs, the pomegranates, the grapes, and many other kinds of fruit. And I asked Jesus to let me eat of the fruit, but he said, not now. Those who eat of this fruit, of this land, uh, go back to earth no more. But in a little while, if faithful, you shall both eat of the fruit of the tree of life and drink the water of the fountain. And he said, so I look forward to that day. Amen. We are going to be together with Jesus, with him for eternity. And there's absolutely, the best news possible is that there's absolutely no reason why any one of us can't be there. He has done absolutely everything. He went to the cross, he paid the price, he shed his blood, he empowers us with his Holy Spirit. He gives us everything that we need each day to live and honor and glorify him. It's just such good news. And he's promised he's prepared a place for us. And he's going to go and prepare a place. And he's coming back again, he said. That where, we, that where I am, he said, that's where you may be also. We look forward to his coming. Don't you? Amen. And so communion. In communion, we remember we are shown that the Christian's life 
is a life of humility and self-sacrifice. A Christian's life is one of partaking daily of the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. As we partake and commune with him, he said, abide in me and I in you as a vine, I am the branch and you're the vine. As you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Fruit comes only from, by connection with Christ. So Jesus shows us, and it has to be so close, it's just like eating bread and, and, the, and, the, and the fruit juice. Uh, it just it comes and assimilates, and it's every part of us in the same way Jesus, when he comes into our hearts, and he's, he's just every part of us, every cell is filled with his love. And as we live that love in a world that needs to see Jesus more than ever before, then we are fulfilling his purpose for us. And then he says, ultimately, I'm going to come back and get you. And we're going to have an amazing time with, with, together for eternity. And we're going to sit down at that big table and we're going to have a big banquet. How many want to be at that banquet? Amen. How many would say, no, I don't really want to be there. I think I'll just go home. I'll go to McDonald's later on today. <laughs> Is there any comparison? No. I praise the Lord. If you didn't put your hand up and you wanted to, just put it up. Uh, I don't know if anyone's in that boat. But if you... But if you weren't sure if you really want to be part of that or you're not sure if it even exists, get into the word. Study God's word. It is true. Jesus is coming again, bringing us into his kingdom, and he wants you and me all to be there. Let us pray. Precious Heavenly Father, truly we are blessed to have a time now that we can participate in this service that you said three times that blessed are they if you know these things. Blessed are you if you know these things and you do them. Lord, you've invited us into this very special time to humble ourselves uh, and, and to wash each other's feet. And so, Lord, and then to come back and to partake in this beautiful remembrance service, remembering what you have done for us. And a time to celebrate all the blessings of life that you, we can share testimonies, Lord, to you. And then to remind us that you're coming and we're going to have a, an amazing time with you for eternity. And we're going to have a big banquet and you're going to partake of that same beautiful, pure juice of the vine. One again. And you're not doing it now because you're waiting for that great day when we can all be together to enjoy it together. We thank you, dear Lord, for giving us this, these special uh, moments to enjoy together, to remember you and prepare our hearts for your coming. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.